Um, this, is, uh, this is continuous and it's bounded, um, but it's not uniformly continuous because the slope of this graph is kind of infinitely steep, right? That's one way to think about it. But all I said was, this is a bit tough to describe, so we omit the details of the solution. See me in person. Alternatively, uh, uh, you can actually, well, you can actually make this uh, into a more formal solution. Uh, it turns out that this function right here will work. It's pretty clearly uh, continuous because it's a composition of continuous functions. Josh, you can sit here if you want. Oh, okay. I'll just move this stuff. There you go. <laughs> so it's pretty clearly a continuous function as bounded between minus 1 and 1. But to show that it's uniformly continuous right now, really the only thing you could do would be to use the epsilon delta definition. That's a little bit difficult to do. There's an easier way using the derivative, but I just haven't talked to you guys how to do that yet. So don't worry about problem 4C. The other one is um, problems 6 and 7, the last two problems on the assignment, have to do with derivatives. On problem 6, it, you're actually being asked to use the definition of a derivative to prove it. So I want you to use the definition. But on problem 7, you can use the rules that we learned. So, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. What I'd like you to do, though, is identify which rule you're using, uh, or maybe you're using more than one, but explain the rules that you're using and which function is which. So, like, if it's a composition of two functions, what's the f of x, what's the g of x in that composition? Or if you're using it for the quotient rule, or whatever, right? So, basically, I want you to just um, plug it into the statement of the of those uh, different derivative rules. Does that make sense? But you don't have to use the definition on the last problem. It's mostly just a refresher on the things you know from Math 150A. You know, it's just probably been a while since you've taken the derivative around here. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that would be good, good to do. Uh, other than that, uh, everything else I think is is reasonable. I don't think I need to do any uh, any other clarifying. Yeah, shall we? Are we allowed to? Like, just know that derivative of sine and derivative of cosine? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, and the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. That you know. Okay. Okay, I know I didn't actually ever prove that. You would prove those formulas from the definitions and using trig identities for um, sine of a difference or cosine of a difference. But um, eventually it comes down to calculating a limit, of course, because you're going to be doing it from the definition. And those limits, um, justifying those limits is kind of a little bit beyond what we've talked about. So just go ahead and take, take that on faith. The derivative of sine is cosine. You can use that freely. Okay? A couple of these problems are kind of tricky. So, Dom? So, so on 7a, you want us to break that down into sine over cosine and solve it that way? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we can't just use, that we know what the derivative tangent is and see. But I'll ask, you, I'll ask you to prove. <laughs> no, I just break it down into sine and cosine for me. Yeah. Okay. Other questions on the homework that is uh, that you're doing for later today? Six C. Six C. And I actually don't have the questions in front of me, so could you tell X. me which one that is? The piecewise function f of x equals x sine of one over x. F of x equals x sine one over x. Um, if x is not equal to zero. Right. And then zero if x equals zero. This is a tricky problem. Mm -hmm. This is tricky. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it's going to be bad, but it actually is tricky. There's actually two tricks that you need to do this problem. Okay. So, shall we do it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty optimistic. Okay. okay. So, let's do it. You've got to, what I suggest you do is you do two cases. Case one would be if c equals zero. And then uh, case two would be if c does not equal zero. And in both cases, you need to use the definition. Actually, you might be surprised to learn that the first case is actually the easier case. The c equals zero is easier. So the, the formula for the derivative of this function at zero, which is what c is, that just the, what is the, just the definition? Can somebody tell me? Limit. X approaches C. 
There you go. So the limit of f of x minus f of c all over x minus c. Okay? So what we can do is we can plug in everything that we know. Remember, c is 0. c is 0 right here. So this is really the limit as x goes to 0. Of, so if x is approaching 0, then it doesn't equal 0. So when I plug in f of x, I'm using the top part for it, right? So I would plug in x sine of 1 over x minus f of 0, which is 0. And then I would divide by x minus 0, which is x. And x is approaching 0, so I can just cancel the x's, right? Because x does not equal 0. I'm doing limits. I'm just doing you know, section 4.3 again. OK, what do you know about this limit? Does not exist. I actually think it was done, I think I did that in class, um, using the proposition about sequences, that if you have sequences that converge to 0, then for this limit to exist, the image of that sequence under this function has to exist as well. And that limit is not going to exist in this case. Okay? So, <coughs> okay, so I'll let you guys review, review how we actually showed that that does not exist. But you can just refer to class notes or whatever. To just make sure you understand why this one doesn't exist. This is the graph that does this shape, right? Like this behavior around the y-axis. Something like that. Everybody good with that? Okay. Case two. Prepare to be impressed. <laughs> this is the hard part. Okay. Um, well, it starts out the same. It's just uh, the limit as x approaches c of x sine of 1 over x minus c times sine of 1 over c all over x minus c. Right? And you have to keep in mind that when x is not 0, when you, when you examine what the function is, it looks like a product, right? And it, it really is a product. So you should almost think of this, if you're proving it from scratch, it's like the proof of the product rule. You should expect that the way you're going to do this limit is by approaching it the same way we prove the product rule. Anybody remember how we proved the product rule? We had f of x, g of, so in the numerator we would have had f of x, g of x, minus f of c, g of c. Do you remember what we did? We added and subtracted something in the middle, right? So that's what you want to do here, too. You want to do exactly the same thing. So let's see if we can get this. What do you suppose you, what would you like me to put in the middle here? Put the two parts that we already know there. But I need to now add and subtract something on top here. X sine 1 over C. So minus x sine 1 over c plus x sine 1 over c. You guys like that? Oh, this should be a uh, limit of x part of c. There we go. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, can I erase this part here? Anybody watching on the video will be able to just rewind. <laughs> so now I can erase, with no problem. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's figure out what in the heck is the answer supposed to be. So we all know the, the product rule here, right? That, that's what the answer should be. So the derivative of x is 1. So the, the derivative for x not equal to 0 should be 1 times the sine of 1 over x plus x times the derivative of sine is cosine, and then the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. That's using the chain rule and the product rule and all that. So this is what we expect the answer to be, right? And of course, we would then have to evaluate this at c. So we actually would expect the answer to be sine of 1 over c plus c cosine of 1 over c times negative 1 over c squared. That makes some sense? This is what we expect the answer to be. Do you see any part of that answer up there? You see the sine of 1 over C? 
Where do you see it? Last two terms. The last two terms, exactly. If you look at this fraction right there, the last two terms, you have a sine of 1 over c on top, and you can factor it out and leave yourself with x minus c over x minus c. Right? So the last two terms are going to, uh, and then of course you can cancel the x minus c because it doesn't equal 0. So you're going to cancel that and just get um, sine of 1 over c. So we've, we've actually already got the last part of it. So that's actually this term, right? So the only part that's left is the first part here. The limit as x approaches c of x sine of 1 over x minus x sine of 1 over c all over x minus c. Okay? Now, of course, uh, I, got, I have this x right here common factor of x, and of course as x approaches c, that's converging to c, that looks like that could be this piece, right? That x on top. In fact, let's take that out. So it's going to be c times the limit as x approaches c of sine of 1 over x minus sine of 1 over c all over x minus c. By the way, I, I, I don't know if you guys are trying to write up a final draft right now. I hope not. I hope this is just scratch work that you're doing. Here's the reason I say that, is because I'm going to recommend, for example, that you do this calculation first, almost like it's a lemma. Do it at the beginning to prove to me. Because what I just did right here is I broke up a limit of a product as a product of limits, and that's only valid if both of the limits exist. So you see I'm kind of using... I'm jumping ahead and I'm saying, well, I'm going to already know that this limit in this box <coughs> exists. If this limit in this box exists, well, then, then of course, what I did was valid. But I don't know that yet. <laughs> so I'm still working on it. Um, so I would suggest that you break this solution down into small pieces and present it in little pieces. So this box is the thing we need to focus on at this point. Um, and somehow it should come out to cosine of 1 over c and times negative 1 over c squared. Okay. Does this look um, does this look like a derivative at all? <coughs> it kind of does, um, but not not quite. So I'm going to erase here. I'm going to erase this as well. We got we know what we're looking for. Um, so there are two major tricks you have to use to solve this problem, and here's the first one. The first one is that you need to rewrite um, this limit of uh, sine of 1 over x minus sine of 1 over c all over x minus c. What you need to do is you need to rewrite that as the following thing. You actually need to... Um, Split it into a fraction, into two fractions, essentially. Here's the thing about, about the derivative definition. If you want to use the, der the derivative definition, the, input, the inputs into f on the top here where you're subtracting have to be the same things that are underneath of them. So I look at my inputs here, and they are 1 over x and 1 over c. So what you really need to do is put 1 over x minus 1 over c there. And then, of course, you have to fix that over here on this side. Agree? Now, you again have a product of limits. So you again need to think of it in two pieces. This piece, by simply finding a common denominator of the numerator and doing a little bit of algebra, this piece is going to come out to the negative 1 over c squared when you do that. And again, you might want to have that as a lemma. <laughs> you know, do that first. Do, basically, it's better to prove the little bits and pieces first and then put it all together into a nice flowing proof rather than trying to do the big proof from the beginning and having to keep stopping and going off on the side and do other things. The only reason I'm showing it to you in the do the big problem and break it down into side pieces is because if I just showed you the little pieces, you wouldn't be motivated so much for why that's what you need to be doing. 
So I'm trying to break it down from the big picture to the small picture. But when you present the proof, you want me to have a smile on my face and be happy with it. Do the little pieces first and then <coughs> put them back together. You see what I'm saying? It's so important. So, okay. So this piece, is everybody, can they kind of see it in their mind, what's going to happen? When you put this common denominator here, it's going to be c times x. And then you're going to have c minus x. c minus x versus x minus c gives you the minus sign. And then you're going to have an x and a c, and x approaches c. So really, you have two factors of c that will be on the bottom. That's where that comes from. Okay. So it's really just this one now. And now I've got to figure out this limit. Okay. And the reason that we put this 1 over x minus 1 over c here was to make it kind of look like the derivative format here. But I'm going to use, now I'm ready to use a trick number 2 that you've never seen me do before. So I would, wouldn't expect people to, to do it without a little bit of help. But the second part of the trick into how you come up with this is the following thing. We're going to let um, y equal 1 over x. So you can think of this as a change of variables. Okay. I'm going to rephrase this limit. Of course, c is fixed, but x is a variable, and I'm going to replace x with y using this change of variables. So this limit here, if x was approaching c, then what is y now approaching? 1 over c, agree? y is approaching 1 over c. And then I'm just going to get rid of all the x's and turn them into y's. So sine of 1 over x will become what? Sine of y, good. And then I'm leaving sine of 1 over c exactly how it was. And then on the bottom, 1 over x becomes y minus 1 over c. Now, does that look exactly like the format of the derivative? It really does. The only thing is it's just 1 over c instead of c. But 1 over c is just some other constant. right? Yeah. This is just the derivative of f evaluated at 1 over c. So what is this? This is the derivative of sine of x. I'll just write it like this for a moment. The derivative of sine of x evaluated at 1 over c. So if you're willing to, again, just write down by assumption that the derivative of sine is cosine, and then plug in 1 over c, that's how you get the cosine of 1 over c out of it. Does that make sense? So that is how you do that. There's two tricks to this problem. The first trick is splitting this up into, well, it's right here, splitting this thing into two fractions like that. And then the second trick is the change of variables here at the bottom. So you have to do both of those to really get it to work. So, okay. Everybody happy with that? <coughs> you guys happy with that? Okay. <laughs> um, if they're not, they can't do anything about it, so... <laughs> Uh, all right, so I answered that. Are there other questions on the homework? Number five. Number five, can you tell me what it is? Because I don't even know. Number eight from the book. That oh, number eight from the book. I do have the book in front of me. Oh, show that if D is bounded and F is uniformly continuous, then F is bounded. Yeah, we can do that. Thanks for coming in on the weekend, guys. I just don't have enough time in lecture to do all these problems. I want to help you with all the homework and stuff. I just can't do it all in class. So I appreciate you taking the time. Um, so D is bounded. Remind me again, what does that mean? Nobody knows. I have a hard time doing this problem. <laughs> Gotta get our assumptions down here. D is bounded me. It's a set, right? What's it mean for a set to be bounded? Bounded below and bounded above. And what does those words mean? There's some number that's the biggest and some number that's small. Um a real number, right? Just a finite, a finite real number, right? So there's there's some bound. I usually like to call it B, mm -hmm. and the whole set 
lies between negative b and positive b. So the, the domain b is you know, some set here. There's some way to put that into some interval from negative b to positive b. So some, something like that, right? So d is bounded. OK, we got that. Then what else do we have? f is uniformly continuous on d. OK, so we got that. And so then it says prove that f is bounded on d. So really, I don't know that I ever actually defined that in class. What, what it means to say that a function is bounded. I know what it means to say that a set is bounded, because that's what we just described. But now we're saying we want to prove that the function is bounded on d. So I have to explain what that means. What that really means is, i.e., what that really means is that if you look at the set of all of the outputs, you take every possible output f of x, where x is in d. So this, this takes the function and puts it into the context of a set. It's really the image of the function, the range of the function. That set, the range of f, we call that the range of f, right, is bounded in the sense of sets. In the sense of sets being bounded. Is that good? Okay, the way to do this is by way of contradiction. That's what you want to do. Um, you want to suppose that this range of this function is not bounded. Okay, so let me, I'm going to get you started on the proof, but I'll probably quit somewhere along the line, hopefully before I get to the end. Um, by way of contradiction, suppose uh, that f is not bounded on d. What that really means is that um, if the function gets well, that the function gets arbitrarily positive, big positive, or arbitrarily big negative, right? It doesn't, it doesn't fit between the graph. Like, this would be bounded, right? I could put the whole graph between two lines. That's bounded. What we're saying here is that um, let's suppose that f is not bounded. I'll give you another example. Suppose you took, we've looked at this example before, 1 over x, right? That graph blows up and basically looks like this, okay? I can take a bounded interval. I can take the bounded interval. The, the open interval 0, 1 is bounded, right? Certainly that's bounded. But the image of that open interval would be all of this stuff here, right? Is that bounded? No, the, the domain is bounded. This is D. The domain is bounded, but the image is not bounded. In other words, for every horizontal line that I draw, the function gets above that line eventually at, at some point in the domain. It right? doesn't matter how far up I go, I can always go above that line. Does it contradict this problem? We have a bounded domain, but the image of the function was not bounded? So is that, does, that make a, does that mean our problem is... is Flawed? Right, this function here, 1 over x, is not uniformly continuous. It gets arbitrarily steep, right? There's no maximum steepness to the graph. So 1 over x is not uniformly continuous on this domain, I should say. On another domain, it might be. But on the domain of the open interval 0, 1, it's not. Okay. So this is an example of something that's not bounded. For every horizontal line that I draw through that graph, the function gets above it. Is everybody with me? I want you guys to understand this problem completely. Good? Okay, so here's what I'm, here's what I'm going to suggest you do. Uh, if it's not bounded, then for each n... Oh, um, one other comment here. I'm trying to now disprove that f is uniformly continuous. What is a prime procedure for disproving uniform continuity? Sequences. sequences, and what is the prime result about sequences that we learned last week that we could be keeping an eye out for in this solution? 
Cauchy sequences, right? Remember that uh, continuous functions preserve convergent sequences, but uniformly continuous functions must do more than that. They actually must preserve Cauchy sequences, right? So, so we want to be on the lookout for a Cauchy sequence. So I'm starting to form a sequence because I'm going to index for each natural number here. For each natural number, I'm going to um, do something. Okay. So for each natural number, f is not bounded, so I claim that there exists a point xn in D with f of xn greater than n. So the function is unbounded. Now I have to be a little careful because it might be unbounded in the negative sense, so I should probably allow for that by putting those absolute value bars on that. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so I have a bounded sequence of inputs here, and then I've got these outputs that are not bounded. Okay. Does anybody know, the connect is there a connection we can make at this point? Is there, is there something that we know um, that we can do? Look at just the xn's. Don't worry about f of xn. Just look at xn. xn is also bounded? So xn is a bounded sequence because d is bounded, right? That was given. So d is bounded, so we have a bounded sequence. Yes, bolzano weierstrass theorem. Right, you just, bounded sequence, ding, 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 bolzano weierstrass theorem, right? So there exists a convergent subsequence, right? I should make sure, keep, you guys keep those flashcards going. We're going to have another definition quiz before Thanksgiving. So keep, the, keep making the cards with all the words on them. So by the bolzano weierstrass theorem, and I don't even know yet why that even matters. Okay, great, we have a conversion subsequence. But we surely ought to write that down. So there exists, let's say, x, n, k, and it converges to x. Where does x live? It does? Does it have to live in D? If D was a closed interval, I would grant you that it has to be in D. But it's not a closed interval. Like here, I could have a convergent sequence, subsequence, converges to 1, which is not in the interval. And there's actually nothing that even says D is an interval. It's just a domain, a bounded domain. So I don't have any idea where that X lives. Let's just say it's a real number somewhere. <laughs> okay, not necessarily in the domain. But do we actually care about that? Do we care that it's converging to a particular point? No. Why do we not care about that, Nathan? Because you just want it to be Cauchy. Because you just want it to be Cauchy, exactly. We're, we're, we're trying to use the Cauchy sequences characterization, and any sequence that converges is Cauchy. So x, n, k is Cauchy. Therefore, if you are also given that your function is uniformly continuous on D, and you have a Cauchy sequence in D, then the image of that sequence must still be Cauchy in D. So f of x and k is Cauchy. That's not Cauchy in D, is it? That's Cauchy in R. You can just say Cauchy. Okay, so that's Cauchy. Is there a problem with that? Yes, there is, and I'll let you guys go figure out what it is. It has to do with this. Okay, so think about what you know about Cauchy sequences, and you're about one line from being done, and I have to let you do that part. Otherwise, I won't feel like I did too much. Okay, everybody comfortable with that? Does that help you out, Dom? Yeah. Great. Anybody else having any more problems with anything else? <coughs> This is how my, my grading is hopefully going to be fast this week. Everything yeah. perfectly right. <laughs> Anything else at all on the homework? If not, I'll switch gears and give you a couple other things to chew on. Can you look at number three?